Welcome. Good afternoon, Club 17. Great to be here today. We have a wonderful program I think you'll really enjoy. And we're going to kick things off today with the Star Spangled Banner, a performance by the U.S. Marine Band. So join me. Now, Russell Smith is going to lead us in the invocation and the four-way test. Will you bow your heads? Lord, in you we live and move and have our being. We come to you with grateful hearts. We are grateful for the meals that have nourished our bodies. We are grateful for the fellowship that nourishes our spirits. We are grateful for the program today that will nourish our mind. We pray that you would be with all of us here today. Be with all the staff here at the Netherlands, for they have blessed us with their service. May you bless them a hundredfold in return. Be with all of our family of Rotary. Strengthen us all to pursue the ideal of service above self. And be with our speaker, Charlie Frank. Bless him and the whole Reds Community Fund as they continue to work to bless youth in our community and live out the ideal of service above self. Amen. And now my friends, join our voices together in the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Seats. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. And we have a number of announcements today. Uh, start with birthdays. August 12th, Bev McCarthy, Bill Powell. August 15th, Steve Brash. And August 17th, Tom Noonan. Let's congratulate them. And I wanted to read a thank you letter we got from Norwood City Schools. It's really addressed to the Rotary Club. Dear Mr. Labar, I want to thank you and your club for the landscaping work your club members provided at Norwood High School and Middle School on July 18th. Our board members had noticed the huge mountains of mulch on Friday evening as we entered the building for our meeting. We could not believe it had all been spread in the flower beds when we returned after the weekend. I understand that over two dozen members of Club 17 participated in this community service event what a wonderful gesture on your club's part to welcome students back to a beautifully manicured campus. Please extend my gratitude to all who made this wonderful community service possible to support the success of our students in the Norwood City Schools. Sincerely, Brandon Atwood, President, Board of Education. Well done, Club 17. And uh, a few more announcements. Uh, as a reminder, a, a number of people have signed up for the picnic August 22nd, which includes the Rolling Roto Run, 
uh, car rally, which will be a lot of fun, and that starts in the morning at Camp Allen. It ends 3.30 at Camp Allen with an ice cream social. We will follow all of the right protocols in terms of social distancing. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. If you have any questions, please contact the committee co-chairs, Chris Adams, Angie Ferguson, or Owen Rassman with any questions. But again, tomorrow is the last day to sign up. So please contact the office if you'd like to come. And for Believe to Achieve, uh, this will be a virtual event this year. Uh, all the gifts that are being donated go to the benefit of three uh, societies or um, associations that we've done a great job helping. One is Autism Society, Down Syndrome Association, and, and the last stepping stones, of course, Camp Allen. Tomorrow is the last day to drop off your donations. Uh, drop them off to the Rotary office because uh, the team will be preparing all the final items for a virtual event on September 19th, and that's great causes and a great opportunity to show support for those charities. Now here's a different one. Well, I don't think we've done this one before. We're going to have a virtual pet show. So if, if you're like me, every, ba every baby is beautiful, every pet is beautiful, but there will be some awards given this time. So what we're going to do is have a, a five evening long show, I guess it'll be, uh, a series of pictures that pet owners take. So Monday is going to be called Barnyard Friends. Uh, that's horses, cows, pigs, oh my, whatever else. Tuesday is Poocher Parade, and we're going to the dogs for that one. Uh, my dog will be in that one. Wednesday is Kitty Corral. Sweet or obnoxious, we want to see them. Now, I did not write that word obnoxious in there. I want you to know for the cat owners. Thursday is all the rest, reptiles, hamsters, rabbits, guinea pigs, fish, anything goes. And then Friday will be best of show. And vote for your favorite on our Facebook group poll. And the winner of the whole thing gets a $100 Amazon gift card. So take photos of your favorite pet and put them out on our Facebook page and more details will follow. Uh, but should be a lot of fun, I think it's a neat event. And Members in the news, uh, happy 45th wedding anniversary to Rotarian Michael Villardo and his lovely wife Marcy. Congratulations to them. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker today, and a number of people in our club know Charlie Frank. Charlie Frank is the executive director of the Reds Community Fund. And he began uh, that role here in 2004. And during his tenure, he's helped to complete the $8 million PNG Cincinnati MLB Youth Academy Complex. He's led major league baseball all-star legacy projects. And he helped to secure the 2011 Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Steve Patterson Award for Excellence in Sports Philanthropy. And among his duties, Charlie oversees youth baseball and softball programs, directs the community fund's field renovation efforts, including the 150th, hard to believe, 150th anniversary projects in St. Bernard and Bellevue, Kentucky, and leads the annual community makeover collaboration. And he has established annual fundraisers such as the Marty Brenneman Golf Classic, the Red Legs Run, and the F Fox Sports Ohio Telethon. And Charlie serves on the boards of several uh, organizations, the CPS Activities Beyond the Classroom Foundation, Kid Glove, and the Hollum House. And in 2018, he received the Joe Nuxell Humanitarian Award. So previously, Charlie spent 11 years with the NBA's Minnesota Timberwolves as Vice President of Communications. And Charlie has a deep rotary connection. His father, John, is a member of our club, a longtime member here. Charlie's a Northwestern University and Walnut Hills High School graduate. And we're not. And uh, Charlie and his wife, Amy Snyder, reside in Cincinnati with their son, Sam, and daughter, Avery. Please join me in giving Charlie a big rotary welcome.
Thank you, Brett. Got my mask and my glasses already tangled. This is off to a stunning start here. This is, um, oh, and I'm trying to think about a handful of times that I've had the privilege of uh, speaking in front of this group, and it's a pleasure to be back. And as Owen promised, I'm very impressed with how you all have gone about the uh, process of staying safe and, and getting out and still staying active, which I know is extremely important. So Brett, thank you so much. Owen, thank you for all that you do. I could take all 30 minutes thanking you. And Linda, thanks as well. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. And since uh, Brett did mention my father, John Frank, he has been a member of the Rotary Club of Cincinnati now for 63 years, which probably deserves a round of applause as well. So I asked Owen, you know, where, what do you want to cover today? There's certainly a lot of different directions where we could go, both in terms of the community fund being a small nonprofit uh, in the pandemic era, or certainly in terms of what is happening with Major League Baseball as a sport trying to exist outside of the bubble, uh, different from what the NBA is doing in Orlando and what the NHL is currently doing up in Canada. So I figured, you know, we'll, we'll cover a little bit of, of everything here. Uh, but I did want to start back in late February of 2020. And uh, that was a photo that I took from the, the deck of the Goodyear uh, Arizona training complex where the Reds have trained since 2010. And that was uh, what the mornings look like down in the desert. They are spectacular in February and March. And it sure looked like we had a, a fantastic season ahead at that point with $164 million invested by Reds ownership in free agency and uh, a lot of needs from the 2019 team that seemingly had been addressed. Uh, we were well underway. We, we go down there for about a week and you see a member of our staff there getting uh, signatures and doing a lot of paperwork with the players. So we were really excited with the new additions, really pleased with how everything was running down at, at, at training camp. And again, in late February, early March, we had the, uh, the excitement of what could be the first championship season since 2012, 2013 here in Cincinnati for the Reds, which is something our fans so richly deserve and are ready for here after some lean years in between. And also for the community, we just, uh, some of these additions, uh, whether it's Trevor Bauer or Mike Moustakis or Nick Castellanos, you see uh, Aristides Aquino in the image there. We just had so much to be excited about. And, uh, and then it changed uh, in early March. And I think as the waves of information came in, uh, it was interesting flying back to Cincinnati, I believe March 1st or March 2nd. Uh, I had been down there for about a week and you really didn't think much about uh, the virus at that point. You know, you were watching, you know, watching news coverage and, and sort of getting used to it to some extent, but I, th I think it still at least subjectively felt like it was at arm's length. And by the time I flew home on uh, March the 2nd, about half the plane was wearing masks. And I think we were all wondering what was, what was going to happen next. So that red statement, uh, that mirrored the Major League Baseball statement that Commissioner Rob Manfred made. Uh, I believe the date on that is March the 12th. And it was stunning. Uh, you know, we were a month into spring training roughly. And I don't think anyone really knew at the league level or at the team level what it meant to suspend play. A lot of our players didn't know where to go at that point, especially a lot of our international players. A lot of our staff, uh, our baseball staff, our IT staff, a lot of folks stayed down there for another four to six weeks. So as I'm sure the case is for absolutely everyone in this room or everyone watching on YouTube, I mean, uh, no one really knew what to do next. Uh, there was so much uncertainty. From our business standpoint, unlike the NBA and the NHL that were, you know, two-thirds, three-quarters of the way through their season, and not only from a competitive and a fan standpoint, but from a revenue standpoint, you know, virtually all of those checks had been cashed for Major League Baseball, for Minor League Baseball. None of that revenue had really come in yet. We hadn't hosted any games outside of you know, exhibition games. And for most teams, you know, that's a, a very different financial model. So no one really knew what it meant. And it really focused on the importance of communication and the importance of leadership. You know, what, what were we telling our staffs? You know, how could we keep people calm 
despite the fact that none of us really knew what was going to happen next. So, you know, at a personal level, a family level, certainly from a business level, it, uh, you know, like all of you, our heads were spinning. Um, so one of the things we began to do, and so many nonprofits have, nonprofits have done this, a lot of our counterparts with YMCA, Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, Cincinnati Recreation, we were forced to pivot immediately and, and conduct virtual programming and figure out a way to keep our business going, keep our kids and our families engaged despite the fact that our, our academy was closed and uh, you know, our business had basically stopped. Major League Baseball's communication from their youth programs department was really very helpful. Uh, Tony Regans, who's the gentleman who leads that effort now for MLB, he had been the general manager of the, uh, of the Los Angeles Angels for 15 years. He was at the helm when the Angels signed uh, Albert Pujols, so this was very recent. And, and Tony did a great job communicating to us, saying, hey, you gotta celebrate your student athletes, and you gotta communicate. You know, right now, that's an advantage that we're going to have over more expensive youth programs, our ability to communicate, stay engaged. We don't have to act like we know all the answers, but, but keep in touch with people. And like everyone else, we figured out how to operate Zoom to the best of our ability, and we jumped into that, um, you know, with both feet. Um, we did begin celebrating, and that's Amani Reed. She's one of our scholarship winners from our youth academy from Princeton High School. And... You know, this was a whole class of not just senior student athletes, but athletes across the board that were losing their seasons. And, you know, we take baseball and softball obviously very seriously. We take education just as seriously at our beautiful youth academy. And, you know, making sure we had a way to keep these uh, student athletes engaged, but most importantly, figuring out a way to celebrate, recognize, uh, you know, send some love to our seniors that were missing out on their last chance to compete either at high school or potentially for their careers. That was a really important thing that we did. This senior spotlight model was picked up not only by a handful of other teams um, and not only by Major League Baseball, but also one of our, our key sponsors uh, was willing to pivot to this initiative. You see Ohio's 529 plan uh, that was a part of that program. The other thing I mentioned was Zoom calls. Uh, one of the big events we host every May is our signing day event. So we have literally hundreds of students that come through our youth academy that stay engaged with us on a, on a weekly basis, both in terms of baseball and softball and education. But we have 16 student athletes this year that moved on from our academy and our RBI program to sign a letter of intent to play collegiately. And to us, that's not necessarily the pinnacle. I mean, we wanna get kids to college and baseball and softball is the way that we do that but we always want to take a moment and celebrate when kids do use the opportunity uh, to continue their careers. That's obviously a very exciting thing for us. So instead of canceling this event, uh, we hosted it virtually. You see, uh, let's see, Jim Day there, not quite in the middle. He's in the, if you look at the middle four squares, Jim Day from the Reds and from Fox Sports Ohio and his quarantine beard uh, are featured there. So Jim did quite a bit of, uh, of that activity for us. And again, having a signing day event for these uh, young men and women was a way for us to recognize their efforts over a period of years and hopefully soften the blow of them losing their senior years. Similarly, we had started a program the year before with um, Hall of Famer Johnny Bench, who uh, previously had a, about an 18-year program that was based in uh, Omaha uh, in conjunction with the College World Series. And Johnny had picked the top catcher each year in collegiate baseball. Uh, for those baseball fans out there, uh, names like Kurt Suzuki and Buster Posey. So some big names have uh, won this Johnny Bench Award. And last year we convinced Johnny to move it to Cincinnati and to expand it from one winner to ten winners. We wanted to include uh, a female uh, fast pitch softball player at the collegiate level and then we also encouraged Johnny to include high school baseball and softball winners in Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana and West Virginia and Johnny agreed readily and Johnny was thrilled to be able to keep this program going this year on a virtual basis even though we couldn't celebrate on the field, couldn't have our luncheon, couldn't have our catcher's clinic at our Reds Academy, we still were able to celebrate these young men and women uh, who are outstanding and one of the young men you see there is Patrick Bailey. He was the winner from uh, at the collegiate level from North Carolina State University and he was the 12th overall pick 
uh, a catcher naturally uh, of the San Francisco Giants. So Johnny uh, was really excited about that. So these were some of the things that we felt it was important to maintain, uh, both in terms of keeping the spirits up uh, of our kids, of maintaining the relationships with key partners like Johnny and Fox Sports Ohio, and our, um, of course, our, our sponsors as well. And then, you know, we also figured out a way, um, you know, Brett mentioned in the bio our community makeover. Our community makeover uh, has been taking place since 2010, and it's one of the, the wrinkles of the community fund that probably isn't as familiar to most people. I think most people think of us as being the group that, uh, you know, that obviously tries to train on baseball and softball and education and our academy, but we are also out community building uh, primarily once a year in an underserved Cincinnati neighborhood. And last Thursday, that was supposed to be our big $2 million project with Cincinnati Children's Hospital, P&G, the Cincinnati Zoo, the Duke Energy Foundation, and many other fantastic partners. You see on the left there, there's Michael Fisher from Children's, there's Principal Michael Allison from South Avondale Elementary, and there's Phil Castellini, all pretending like they're doing work on a mulch bed. And um, I can tell you, Michael, Allison sure got after it, and Michael Fisher and Phil absolutely have uh, hustled as well. But we, we still showed up there last week. Similar to what you're all doing today, we scaled it back dramatically. We had two shifts, a morning and an afternoon of 20 volunteers each. We spread them out significantly indoor and outdoor. We were blessed with low 80s, low humidity, perfect weather, and we did do a lot of mulching. We built an outdoor classroom uh, for the kids. We enhanced what they call their groom room. As you can imagine, with South Avondale being one of the most underserved schools uh, throughout CPS, they need a room, at least one room, in that school that uh, provides clothes, shoes, uh, a, place to, a place to bathe, changing rooms, supplies, things that most of us don't have to think about, uh, that kids that enter that school, you know, sometimes on a daily basis, uh, do need to think about, and Principal Allison who is a shining star, has been there 13 years, and who has had the opportunity to leave, he stays embedded in that community knowing the need. So instead of working at six different sites last week, we worked at one. Uh, our volunteers also stuffed gift bags for 700 kids, not just for uh, the kids at South Avondale, but for nearby Rockdale Academy, which is also a K through six CPS school. P&G provided uh, donated product, for all 700 plus families, so one goodie bag of that, and then the volunteers also stuffed backpacks with school supplies for the year, hoping um, so fervently that these kids can actually be in the classroom this year, because you know when the uh, when the crisis hit last March, especially for the younger students, they already had the established rapport with teachers, and again, I think something that's lost on those of us that aren't on the front line right now, we, f we fail to realize how difficult this is going to be for younger kids and teachers that haven't had that real face-to-face -face contact yet to now go virtual. So our fingers are crossed, and whenever those kids are back, which hopefully will be in September, they're, uh, they're gonna have these backpacks and goodie bags waiting for them. And if they're not back in September, we will find a way uh, to make sure these, uh, these items land in the hands of the kids. On the right is an image of, the, of, of a free store food bank project called the Healthy Harvest Mobile Market. And our community makeover partners, even though this year we didn't have the ability to take on this broader scope, we did uh, raise another $180,000 in incremental money. And, to, and for that, I need to thank P&G, Cincinnati Children's, and the Duke Energy Foundation for stepping up. And then they allowed us to be a part of how these dollars got allocated. So uh, the biggest chunk of it has gone to Free Store, and with Free Store, we really focused on their mobile market, which takes place in the Avondale community. So again, our community makeover would have been in Avondale this year, and this was a way for us to still feel like we were making an impact in that neighborhood before our bigger project is possible next summer. So we've really gotten to know the staff that runs this two-hour weekly market, and they do it at 12 different sites throughout the week. It is literally uh, fresh food, fresh produce, great service, um, and, and there is a payment system that makes it really accessible for area residents. So we've had a great experience working with Free Store during this incredibly challenging time for them. Uh, and we've also worked uh, hand in hand with the Urban League of Greater Southwestern Ohio. And I know you had the chance to meet uh, their incredible leader, Eddie Cohen, here last week. So, you know, just a couple of the things that we've done sort of beyond our, our typical lane here during the, uh, the crisis this summer. 
Uh oh. Skipped ahead there. There we go. Um, I wanted to talk about May 26th. May 26th was the day that Governor DeWine declared that teams could return, return to play. And it happened fairly suddenly. And it was one of the most challenging uh, dynamics that, that I've had to manage in my, in my 17 years with the Reds. Because so many of the kids that we serve come from underserved neighborhoods. And you know, predominantly minority population, they're the population that is most at risk uh, for COVID-19. So working with our coaches that reside and lead in those neighborhoods, trying to figure out what was the safe, responsible thing to do when all of these kids had been cooped up, had missed months of school, were absolutely chomping at the bit to get outdoors and play, and managing that safely was incredibly hard. Uh, we did end up uh, having 13 of our 26 RBI developmental teams resume. Those are the teams that we operate year round out of our academy. RBI is Major League Baseball's reviving baseball in inner cities. So we not only had them abide by uh, the rules of engagement that you see there that were provided by the state of Ohio and that had been updated several times, but we also added a very uh, stringent layer of uh, additional guidelines, including having each team declare a compliance representative that could not be a coach, that was doing the temperature checks and the uh, medical screenings on an everyday basis, whether they had practice games or not. And we really have been able to get by without any issues. We had a couple of family members that were sick. We had a couple teams that we shut down for uh, precautionary measures, but we've been relatively safe. And you see um, one of the groups of teams out on the field for one of our programs with everyone wearing masks. And up at the top right, you see one of our staff doing a temperature check from a recent RBI tryout at our youth academy. So getting these teams back and doing it safely and responsibly has again been one of the more delicate challenges of the year. But it also created one of our opportunities. Uh, we could not stand the thought of urban teams having to share helmets during this crisis. And for those of you familiar with baseball and softball, you know these are expensive sports to play. They really are. That is one of the primary barriers that prevents you know, minorities from really engaging with the game. And that's just a reality. But this year it was more than just being able to engage with the game. The dehumanizing thought of having you know, black kids, minority kids, urban kids, having to share helmets or spray down helmets when suburban kids and more affluent teams, no knock on them, but they come, each kid carrying their own bag, their own bats, their own helmets, their own gloves, their own gear. We wanted to do what we could to level the playing field. We got a $100,000 grant through Phil Castellini, him working his magic, uh, but he said, here's the deal. Uh, whoever you pick has to be a nonprofit provider and they're not gonna get paid until September, so good luck to you. Uh, well, as it turns out, we have this fabulous partner out of Pennsylvania called Pitchin' for Baseball and Softball. And uh, they have a great relationship with Wilson Sporting Goods. They sent us thousands of helmets. You see one of the young men wearing them on the left. Nice gear, batting gloves, baseball, softballs, just the necessity so that kids could have their own stuff. Each team had more and more baseballs and softballs so that we weren't reusing balls that may be contaminated. So no one, since no one really knew how that worked, um, and this story has be, been one of, the, one of my favorite moments of this year, just being able to get so much gear into the hands of teams that really needed it. Um, of course, in late May and early June, with uh, all the social and racial unrest, and the, with the movement that took foot not only across the country, but beyond the US, um, you know, we had a big responsibility to play here. What, what do we do with our players? We have just two black players. Uh, that are African-American on our roster right now, which is hard to get your head around. Uh, Amir Garrett and Philip Irvin. And uh, Amir Garrett has really leaned into this issue, to use that phrase. And, uh, and he reached out to Joey Votto in a way that, uh, that resonated with Joey uh, in, in just a remarkable manner. And I'm not sure if those of you out there that are fans of the game or not uh, happen to see this guest column that Joey uh, had about five, six weeks ago in the Enquirer and Cincinnati.com. Uh, if you haven't seen it, again, whether you're a baseball fan or not, it's a very, very honest, moving, uh, transparent piece about what it's like to feel like, you know, throughout our lives that we've cared about diversity, we've cared about 
underserved communities, but recognizing we haven't cared enough. And, and Joey really did an amazing job putting that into words. And I, I can tell you that um, you know, from opening day, uh, you know, being down at the ball field um, and seeing the players kneel on the, uh, I, we've had thousands, thousands of emails and phone calls uh, and business that is threatening to leave the Reds because of our players' response, um, because of their decision to kneel. And I would not get into that topic here because I know it is such a lightning rod for so many. Uh, but I can tell you that you know our players are really trying to act thoughtfully and responsibly, and um, you know this is this is a very interesting crossroads for not just the Reds organization, but for the entire industry. You know, w wanting to show support, wanting to, you know the Reds have such profile, not just in this market, but in this region, and with that profile comes responsibility and leadership. So we, we've really tried to do our best to to be a resource for our players. Um, to be a resource for our kids and coaches that are on the front lines. And again, Joey did an amazing job here speaking for many uh, in a way that few could. Um, one of the things that we've done in, in, uh, since Joey's column and, and since a lot of uh, statements and, and corporate action has, has come you know, into focus since early to mid-June, is we've had a, uh, a series of panel discussions, and you can see bottom right there, it says reds.com slash unity, and that is our, our website where we have a lot of information about that. There's Amir Garrett, Barry Larkin, Eric Davis, uh, Delino DeShields, who is uh, one of our outstanding coaches, a former player, his son Delino Jr. plays with the Indians, Jesse Winker, who was fabulous on this panel discussion, Brian Giesenslaw, who is also a fabulous broadcaster from Fox Sports Ohio with a fabulous quarantine beard there as well. Um, we had about an hour and a half long conversation. This conversation is available online. Also really eye-opening uh, about the, uh, the times that we're in, uh, the role that sports plays in these times, and the, uh, the ability that athletes have and the responsibility that they have to be a part of the movement. Um, I'm gonna cover a few other things here before I open the, the floor for questions. The PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, I know it's been front and center for many of us. Um, Doug Adams, a longtime Rotarian. Is Doug here today? He is not. But Doug, Doug uh, from PNC Bank, who's also on our board, uh, he really guided us through this process back in April. And, uh, you know, it looks at this point the way the, the whole process went into law in early June, that our loan was going to be forgivable. It's allowed us to keep our programming staff employed. It has been a blessing to us. So I know it has been one confusing subject to follow and we tried not to uh, follow along with each, each bounce. But um, I think as the dust settles, it's gonna be one of the few things that keeps us uh, afloat this summer. Um, and when I say afloat this summer, you know, when we finally reached mid to late June, we had the, uh, the ugly backdrop of the inability of our league and our ownership to find peace with our players association. And again, I'm guessing many of you are fans of the game and fans of the franchise, and I'm sure many of you like me are still um, a little bit sore from what happened in 1994 when the whole season was lost, when the Reds were in first place and the World Series was canceled. And that's something that honestly a lot of fans have never forgiven the industry for. And I don't know if baseball's ever fully recovered from it. So the one thing we could not afford this year was a, uh, some sort of stalemate between the two sides. Back in March, it looked like they had solved it beautifully. Uh, ownership had a $170 million fund that they put together for the players. They awarded the players a year of service time, which was a big concession. The players agreed to prorated money, but they didn't figure out or they didn't put down on paper and confirm what would happen if no fans could go to the games and all that revenue was lost. So that's where things got complicated. Um, as a fan, not an employee, well I guess as both, um, this was not a fun period. Uh, I was not a proud moment and uh, I was terribly frustrated with the inability of either side in the collective process to have the sensitivity that you think would come so easily during a health and economic crisis of our lifetime. Um, 
Fortunately, they did leave the commissioner with the ability to assign a season, which is what happened there you see in the release. Um, the fact that they're back to play and they've had a lot of other challenges may ultimately hide what happened in terms of the inability to reach an agreement, but unfortunately that time is probably looming with the next uh, collective bargaining agreement negotiation which will follow the 21 season. So a lot of what we saw was really posturing for that. It's the business side of the industry. It's not pleasant. It's not pretty. It was terribly timed, uh, but hopefully at least, uh, you know, they'll have the opportunity to work together here this summer and be in a better place as negotiations continue. Our split the pot um, has continued to be a way for us to raise funds and raise awareness. Uh, we don't have all of our volunteers canvassing the ballpark, which is where we make the most of our proceeds, but fortunately last year we did have the ability to add an online program in the state of Ohio. So that's helping us soften the blow a little bit. And then we also had a couple of jackpots for the Urban League. We wanted to find a partner that was doing great work both in terms of COVID and also social and racial justice, and they were the perfect partner, as you heard from Eddie last week. So we did two different jackpots and raised close to $20,000 that had nothing to do with the Reds or the community fund through that program. And then, you know, another silver lining is our match program. Our match program blends urban and suburban teams. It's been operating since 2006. I've had the distinct pleasure of coaching both of my kids in it, and basically, uh, you know, a predominantly suburban neighborhood um, blends with a predominantly urban one, and you're bringing together different races and backgrounds in a way that breaks down barriers very easily through the game. And we focus on a younger age group, so they're not necessarily hung up with, uh, with any stereotypes. So this year, two of our longtime match partners, St. William Athletic Association over on River Road, and the West End Reds, which is one of the tremendous decades old, uh, truly urban baseball and softball organizations, they didn't have enough kids on either team to form a 9U. And they heard about it, and they decided that this match group was gonna form their own team together. So that's what you see there. The West End Reds and the St. William Knights became the Red Knights this year with seven kids from the West End and seven kids from St. William. So it's again been a really cool moment from our summer and the kids have gotten along beautifully and the coaches are marvelous and really inspiring. <laughs> a few other highlights here, my goodness, where would we be this year without Mike's car wash? Uh, for the last five years, they've hosted Bowtie Tuesdays, uh, which Chris Welsh has, has dressed the part for. And when the Reds have won on a Tuesday, it meant a $5 discount on an ultimate wash on Wednesday, and a dollar from that discount went to the community fund. Well, last year, you can see on the right, that was pre-COVID. That's why everybody is standing close and not masked. Um, you know, that was close to a $50,000 donation. This year, when baseball stopped, they replaced Bowtie Tuesdays with Kids Win Wednesdays. So they, they you know, and the weather turned nice, and they've already raised $51,000 for our programs you know, before baseball even resumed. So um, cannot say enough what a great community partner they are, and wouldn't be doing my part if I didn't recommend going to Mike's Car Wash any day, but especially on a Wednesday after the Reds win on Tuesday. I mentioned Split the Pot. Uh, we raised over 17,000 for our opening series with Detroit. Um, the numbers are dwindling a little bit, uh, but you can play at any time, reds5050.com. You just have to be 18 or older. And in the state of Ohio, when you play, we certainly hope you'll get the word out. It's a lot of fun. And again, it's an important fundraiser for us. Uh, we also had a fundraiser uh, with Marty Brenneman and uh, local attorney Randy Freaking. And we had a really cool poster on the left side of this slide that must not have made it. But this was, uh, again, one of the first opportunities to actually go outside and be a part of a live event. And we did it at the Starlight Drive-In and uh, had over 100 cars, raised over $30,000, and everyone got to hear from Marty Brenneman and watch Field of Dreams. It was a nice way to kind of get back out there before the Reds resumed play. And then the Reds finally did resume play on, uh, on the 24th of July. Um, there are a number of us that have the credentials in this weird season where we can be out there flipping the Ks for Kroger and LaRosas uh, when the Reds strike out 11 or more, which has been an almost every night appearance. 
And you can see on the right, we've also been given those pickers to pick up foul balls for our Authentics program. Uh, we had a, uh, a Rizzo home run ball, an anti Rizzo home run ball on our Authentics program that went for $2,500. And uh, we've got a Joey Votto home run ball, a, a Castellanos Grand Slam ball that's live right now at reds.com slash auctions. And this is another great fundraiser for the community fund. And this is a strange year when we're able to get virtually every foul ball and every home run ball which isn't the case. Uh, sad, but that's the way it is right now, and it's been very surreal to be there on a number of games working. I, I mentioned La Rosa's, um, another great community partner. Instead of uh, being able to give fans uh, the small pizza every time there's 11 strikeouts by Reds pitchers with no fans in the stands, they decided to donate $1,000 to the community fund uh, not only for every home game, but for every road game as well. And we've already had, I think last night was our 10th game with 10, 11 strikeouts or more. So we certainly have the starting pitching to make this a very lucrative promotion this year. And our hats off to La Rosa's for their generosity. And then there are the Reds cutouts. Uh, if you look on the right, I think you can see Owen and Jan Rassman and uh, two of their beautiful canines. This one almost didn't happen. We just got this in under the wire. It, um, we didn't know whether we'd have fans in the stands. The A's, the Giants, the Royals, the Brewers, a handful of other teams had led the way. We finally got this one under the wire. Uh, it has been so much fun. Uh, people have talked about it. We haven't had to put a penny of marketing into it because you see it and you hear it everywhere. The announcers talk about it, the local TV and radio and print folks talk about it. Uh, so it's been a lot of fun and we have this remarkable staff uh, that is able to handle it all. All of the uploading of the images, all the corrections, all the help for people that aren't technologically savvy. Um, and, and we've been installing them here over the last few weeks working around uh, the limitations of when we can and can't be on the field. And Initially, I was told, well, you know what, why don't you use the first two sections of, of the sun deck and moon deck? I said, well, that's only about 400, 500 seats. And they said, well, how many of these do you think you're going to sell? I said, I, I think 1,000 or more. We're at 3,600 of these already. And we've raised over $200,000. So thank goodness uh, we took a chance on it. So we'll see what happens here over the next month. But thanks to everybody that's had a lot of energy and interest on that one. Last night, uh, Brett mentioned our Fox Sports Ohio telethon. That took place last night, and even though we didn't have all the bells and whistles of being at the ballpark, we were able to raise uh, over $180,000. That includes a $75,000 donation from uh, PNC Bank. So hats off to Kay Geiger and Doug Adams and their terrific team. Uh, you can still purchase this great gift bag. That's how the, the donations come through. You $100 donation gets you that Barry Larkin, uh, you know, uh, 1990s replica jersey, this dual Jeff Brantley bobblehead, uh, two Reds uh, pint glasses, really nice stuff. $200 gets you a signed Reds mini helmet as well. So uh, reds.com slash telethon while supplies last, or a few hundred there uh, for anyone interested, and you can find that all online. And then last but not least, uh, Marty Brenneman has this uh, tremendous new documentary that will be premiered, world premiere, also at the Starlight Drive-In out in Amelia. That's next Monday, August 17th. And the film producer, a guy named Terry Lukemeyer, working with local comedian uh, and terrific guy Josh Sneed, they, they've done a great job with this film. It is $75 for a carload of six, and the proceeds, they're nice enough to direct to the community fund and all of our programs, so that's next Monday. So uh, that is our story for this year. That's how we've done our best to kind of stay on our feet. We've had a lot of good luck. Um, we've had a tremendous amount of support. We were buoyed quite a bit by the fact that baseball did come back for a 60-game schedule, even though financially for the team that doesn't necessarily uh, move them any forward. But I think everyone understood that that was something necessary for the industry. And we're all very grateful that we're out there playing. We hope that the league can find a way to keep everyone safe. The Cardinals have played five games so far. There's a lot to figure out, but we're grateful that it's up and going and um, you know, that we've been able to be a, a, a part of the community's response to uh, these incredible challenges this year. So um, I'm certainly open for questions for the next few minutes. I know we're about 120 right now, so any questions? 
Oh, thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, sure. So the question was, uh, you know, what's the feeling amongst the players? How are they handling this unique season and, and all of the restrictions? I think our team's been extraordinary. They've uh, made a lot of good decisions. They have tremendous leadership. David Bell uh, and his staff uh, stayed in communication, uh, you know, literally on a daily basis with our team. So, you know, we didn't have anyone opt out. Um, the one positive test that we had through Matt Davidson who made the roster turned out to be a, a false positive. And, you know, we've had a couple of players, Mike Moustakis, Nick Senzel, Joey Votto, who reported symptoms, immediately took themselves out of the clubhouse and who tested negative. So uh, we haven't had anything resembling an outbreak. Uh, we've been able to manage all of the nuance on the road. I've heard nothing but positives from the players in terms of their appreciation for the efforts of our medical staff and our baseball staff and our ballpark operations staff. These people have managed contingency after contingency after contingency. There's a gentleman who Owen knows uh, who is one of the unsung superstars. His name is Tim O'Connell, who's the senior vice president of ballpark operations. You see this guy every minute of every day, a sunny, helpful, collaborative disposition. This guy has worked 24 hours a day, and it's those efforts that I think have kept our players safe. But, you know, Joey Votto speaks for a lot of them. I don't feel the fatigue. I think they feel like they're really in this together, and I think they feel as though they're able to provide people with a sorely needed source of entertainment. So I, I and we don't have access to them at all, other than virtually, but, um, you know, I hear nothing but positives. It's a good question. Any other questions? Oh, yes. For Tim. For those of us, uh, myself included, that have season tickets, yes. uh, have you heard whether or not those packets of tickets that we have that will go unused will be a great collector item? <laughs> uh, have you received your tickets already? then they are definitely a great collector's item. Yeah, um, yeah. I think so many things from 2020 are gonna be collector's items. That's why our Authentics uh, online auctions seem to be doing so well. Uh, you know, this has been a terribly difficult thing and our ticketing staff, uh, to the credit of Reds fans, the amount of available refund money that has been claimed has been about a third of the overall total. So most fans are really keeping their money inside the organization, I think to show support and to, um, you know, to indicate their interest in staying engaged in future years. So um, very, very classy on the part of Reds fans. I know many in here, Jane, it looks like you might be in that, uh, in that category. So thank you to those that have done it. Yeah, anything that you have already, I would definitely frame it, or have Owen frame it. He's good at that. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, um, there's a lot of talk in the news about what's gonna happen. It will there be fans in the stands this, this season, so thank you for not asking about that. I have no clue. Uh, it has to run through a lot of uh, hurdles. If that were to happen, that seating system, all the ticketing would be unique and independent of anything that you know people already have. And, and we, again, have people working around the clock to figure out how that would work. So everyone, thank you again so much. We, re we really appreciate what you've shared, Charlie. It's been, uh, I think, an eye-opener for, for me in terms of the number of different activities Red's Community Fund is involved in and the level of engagement with so many parts of our community, which is just great to see. And in that sense, Rotary is similar because we look at ourselves, obviously, as being very embedded in the community and looking for ways to help improve the lives of others, and particularly like the Reds Community Fund, the lives of young people in our community is a special focus. So just great work, uh, great presentation. And we want to thank you today for coming. And you know uh, about Rotary already. Uh, we've had a decades-long program to eradicate polio. And in your honor for speaking, we'd like to make a donation to that fund 
the End Polio Now Fund, which is a, a global fund. So thank you so much for that. And Charlie, the other thing I want to say is um, you're very focused, the community fund is very focused on opening opportunities for people in the community, particularly young people. We're very focused on that too. As a matter of fact, that is our theme for this Rotary year, is that Rotary opens opportunities and we have uh, a pin to signify that, so I'd like to give you one of those as well. We'll have to know where the masks are, right? Um, this has been a great meeting. It's wonderful to see so many people here. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming and wish you a great weekend. See you next Thursday. Meeting adjourned.